I have never met one single person who doesn't have any gifts, but I've met loads of people who wonder if they even just have one. I think part of the problem is this word gifts. So when we hear that word gifts or talents, instantly we think of someone who can sing or dance or talk to dead people or solve gigantic quadratic equations without using a pencil. So I think the first step is we need to look at gifts in a broader way. So a simple shift is to start calling them strengths. There's no one that can say they don't have strengths, right? And I bet you have strengths you're not even aware of. Now the thing about strengths, they're really an ability you have. It's something that comes very naturally to you. It's something that when you do it, you actually feel stronger. It's something that you can imagine yourself doing repeatedly, happily, and successfully. Now most people overlook their strengths because the fact it comes so naturally to them, they take it for granted. For instance, are you a great learner? Do you have a strong sense of empathy? Do you thrive on competition? Do you have a knack for imagining the future and getting people excited about it? Can you win other people over even if you've just met them? All those things or strengths are what you might call gifts. And yes, they are special and useful even if they're not talent show material. Now, once you know your strengths, the whole key is to continue to use them as often as you can and to develop them. It's a big key to happiness both in your regular life and at work. Now, here's a big thing you don't wanna get tripped up on. Don't try and look for the perfect job or the perfect business to start in order to express your strengths. So for example, in my own life, two of my top strengths are positivity and communication. Now, I used these strengths when I was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street. I used them when I was a bartender. I used them when I was a Nike athlete. And I use them every single day in my business and here on Marie TV. The two most important steps you can take are number one, recognize that yes, you do have gifts. You just gotta start calling them strengths. And number two, you wanna find out what those strengths are and start using them as often as you can because the world really does need it. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I was making 300 bucks a month. I quit on my business partner and the thing that saved me was studying the stories of super successful entrepreneurs. So I hope that this story today helps give you the motivation you need because I still need it to myself. So today let's learn from one of the best, Marie Forleo and my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is be true to yourself. We have a whole kind of series. There's a chapter in the book about the power of defining your dream, whatever the thing is that you want to devote all this energy and mind share and time share to. And it's really a series of criteria to get real with yourself, to ask yourself, is this the thing I really want to focus on? And so one of the things that we walk people through is the difficulty scale. Right? Has anyone in history ever accomplished anything, either this thing exactly or anything analogous to it? If so, that's awesome. And if not, that shouldn't necessarily deter you, but that should help you prepare mentally and emotionally for the tough terrain ahead. So I think it's just about being real with ourselves. And I also think that we, just as humans, underestimate the value of writing things out and writing things down. You know, when it comes to feeling stuck, when it comes to feeling fear, which can stop many of us, we allow it to stay amorphous and kind of shapeless and like a boogeyman in our head rather than being concrete and specific about it on the page. And so what I've seen in my work for myself and working with tens of thousands of other people is that when you start to write things down and get some distance from it, you have a little perspective, you are so much more capable at cracking into solving some of those problems and seeing how achievable something really is. Rule number three is combat procrastination. What do you advise entrepreneurs who are stuck in their head and, and can't get over procrastination? Procrastination, this is a really good one. So first layer is to actually do a check-in with yourself. Do you actually want to reach this goal or have this experience? I think mm -hmm. that is a first level gut check because sometimes we can see that other people have something, they've experienced something, we might feel that little pang of envy or jealousy and think that we want it too, but then uh, we don't really want it, right? It's like, if you're not actually doing something, you have to really do a gut check, like, do I really want this? So that would be the first layer of check-in. Oftentimes, we think we should want to do something because society has told us that this is what you do when you are X successful, or this is what you should want when you're going on this particular path. Let me give you a concrete example, and then we'll get back to procrastination. So we're going to go on a little bit of a side trip, but hopefully it'll be 
So I remember when I was just getting started in my dance career uh, and I was 25, which in the dance world is greatly over the hill, especially when you're starting in hip hop and street dance. And I just remember going to my first ever class at Broadway Dance Center in New York City. And this is where all the pros go. And I mean, these incredible humans had been training since like they were three or four, you know, and so they're probably around the age of like 18 or 19. They're complete professionals. Here I am at like 25, never taken a professional dance class in my life. And I remember feeling so intimidated that I almost didn't do the class, a form of procrastination, right? Just so terrified and so fearful. Finally took the class, cried because my body was so happy to be in there. But I started looking around and I'm like, wow, everybody's going on auditions and everyone's like going on tours and doing all these things. That must be what you do as a professional dancer. And so, Evan, I started trying to put myself in all of these different experiences, like going on auditions, getting headshots, thinking this is what I have to do. But something didn't feel right. It was like I was chasing these goals that I thought I should be chasing if I wanted to be a real dancer. Cut to some really unfortunate situations. I made such a fool out of myself. I remember this one Missy Elliott particular um, audition that I literally walked out of the room crying because I couldn't keep up with all the choreography. It was so Mm. mortifying and so embarrassing. Fast forward a little bit. I still loved dance, but I loved dance in a fitness environment because it wasn't necessarily about performing on these big stages. It was actually about teaching everyday people how to move their body in such a way where they felt great. And for me, that was like my sweet spot, right? It was encouraging people. It was teaching them to do something that they didn't believe they could do. So a few months later, this opportunity came up. Um, Nike, the company, was starting this new program called the Nike Rockstar Workout. And they were specifically looking for people who had a talent when it came to dance and specifically hip hop and street dance and who also were really good at instructing and motivating. And so I wound up becoming one of the world's first Nike elite dance athletes, but I could have never even become that if I was chasing another goal to be a real dancer going on tours and doing music videos because that wasn't my path. Does that make sense? So when it comes to the procrastination discussion, I feel like sometimes we're chasing goals that the world has set for us, but we don't really want them, but we don't know what else we want. And it has it takes a lot of courage to be able to step away from something everyone thinks you should do and you're just kind of doing it because you think it should be the next step but it's not really your step so that's level one of procrastination level two if you definitely want this thing you want to write the book you want to create the course you want to start the company you want to move to a new country whatever that goal is and you seem to be procrastinating about it you got to put some bumpers in place and what do i mean by bumpers i mean that you need deadlines and most people need support. Some form of accountability. For me, one of the best forms of accountability is actually public accountability. I learned this early on in my career. One of the best ways for me to make sure that I launched a new product was to set a deadline for when it was going to launch and then announce it publicly so I would have to do it. Other people, and I did this with a project early on in my career, um, I wanted to write my first book and I just found myself not like kind of wiggling out of actually getting it done. And the thing that really turned the corner for me was hiring a book coach, someone that I could check in with. And it was worth that investment of money to have someone that I respected, who I had to produce pages for, who would give me feedback. So I had to put those bumpers in place in order to move that goal ahead. I think people greatly underestimate the power of deadlines. Deadlines are huge. If you don't have one, you need to give yourself one. And the bigger you can make the stakes for not reaching it, the better when it comes to procrastination. So there's just two little ideas to get people started. Rule number four is be multi-passionate. The truth is many of us have multiple strengths and passions, but we never give ourselves permission to explore and cultivate them. But I got to tell you, some of our greatest cultural icons have. A classic is Leonardo da Vinci, the Italian polymath, whose interest included invention, painting, sculpting, architecture, science, music, math, engineering, literature, anatomy, geology, astronomy, botany, writing history, and cartography. And sometimes he's even credited with the invention of the parachute and the helicopter and the tank. Then there's one of my 
favorite women of all time, the incomparable Maya Angelou. Maya danced at a strip joint. Then she ran a brothel. She mastered several languages, published not just poetry, but also advice books and cookbooks and children's stories. She danced professionally. She wrote music and plays and screenplays, and she received an Emmy nomination for her acting in Roots. And she was an activist who worked with Martin Luther King to organize the Poor People's March in Memphis, Tennessee. And then, of course, there's James Franco, actor and director and visual artist and author of a book of short stories, a teacher at NYU, UCLA, and a high school. And if you look him up on Wikipedia, the section on other projects is real long. So the question is, how do you make all the things make sense together? Well, here are six ideas for you to consider. Now, some might seem conflicting, so you just choose what is most relevant to you. Number one is embrace your flake. You got to be real about your journey. Just own the fact that you've enjoyed a very rich and diverse path. And if you want to keep experimenting with different ideas, just be real about that too. Stop being ashamed of who you are, woman, whether you're just legitimately confused about what you want to do or you're just genuinely interested in having multiple businesses or parts of your career. You got to own it. You got to love it. You got to hug up on it. Number two, position it properly. So realize that you get to choose how you position anything, like who you are as a human being and your journey. You get to frame your experience both for yourself and for the world. So what's the story you're going to tell? Are you going to position your multi-passionate nature as a strength or as a weakness, as something that makes you fantastic or something that makes you a flake? You can tell someone, uh... Uh, I'm not really sure what I do. Or you could tell someone, what don't I do? Oh, oh she does it. She, oh, she, she, she does it. She does all, 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 all of it. All of it. From the top to the bottom. Like, from the middle to the slide. And then again. Big, little, everything. Choice is yours. Number three, I want you to play in private. So you don't have to announce every time you're going to try something new. That way, when you say you want to switch to running a bakery, you don't have to hear everyone say, what happened to training horses? Just because you can throw up a new website or start a new Instagram account in like four minutes does not mean you should. And if you do, you don't have to put out a press release about it and tell the whole world. I mean, it makes no sense to tell everyone to look at you if you're not really ready to be looked at quite yet. In other words, play with yourself in private. Number four, relish obscurity. So chances are right now, you are the most unknown that you'll ever be in your whole career. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So use this time to make mistakes and just test stuff out. Like try random ideas. You know, other businesses experiment. They do test market things all the time. They do things on a very small scale with just a few people to see if a new idea or product really has legs before they roll it out on a large scale. So use this time when you don't have a huge audience watching your every move wisely. Number five, and this is a big one, do not try and turn everything into a business. Oh my goodness, this is the biggest one of all, all of you, my multi-passionate muffins. Have hobbies and have passions that you don't try and earn a living from. Look, you do not have to monetize everything you do. In fact, you shouldn't. And do not try and cram everything into just one business. Not everything is going to fit together into a narrative that makes sense for customers or for you, so don't force it. Let some of your passions be just that, passions you do purely for the joy of it. Number six, give zero ducks. You know, I've got kids that follow this show now, so while you might be familiar with another word that rhymes with ducks, here we are sticking with ducks. Tanya, it is time for you to stop giving so many ducks about what other people think. In fact, I think you should give zero ducks. You know, you said other people think that you're confused. So what, my love? If I cared what other people thought about how many things that I wanted to do, I'd still be stuck on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange getting taken to strip clubs and doing shots of woo-woo at like 4 p.m. every day. Sorry, kids. You know, at the end of the day, it is your life. You got to ask yourself, are you happy? 
Are you fulfilled? Who cares what other people think then? Hashtag given zero ducks. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is find a mentor. I like learning from a lot of different people with no anticipation or expectation that one person's got to take me under their wing. That feels like too much pressure to me and not really the kind of relationship I honestly want to have with anyone. But no matter what your perspective is, there are loads of ways to get the guidance and that support that you desire, and you can do it starting right now. Here are six ways to help get you started. Number one, you do not need to meet someone to be mentored by them. You know, when I was first getting started, and it's something I still do to this day, I often got mentored by people I have never even met. I did it on my own schedule, through books and tapes and interviews. You know, something we often take for granted is how much effort it takes to write a book or deliver a speech or give a great interview. I mean, those things contain people's best thoughts, all their experiences and all of their lessons, and they're there for you to review and revisit as much as you want. And these days, oh my goodness, with podcasts and online content seemingly coming out of every freaking orifice, you have got mentorship opportunities up the wazoo. It's literally an explosion of free mentorship. An explosion of free mentorship. Explosion. It's combustible. Free wisdom experience. With the business smarts go head to head. Business smart. Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, and Sir Richard Branson. Number two, don't look for one, look for many. I want you to be a swinger, all right? You've heard of polyamory? Try polymentory. In other words, do not put so much pressure on one relationship. It's not wise emotionally or intellectually. Look, if you're only getting advice from one person, you're missing out on hearing and learning from different points of view. And let's be honest. No one person is going to have all the answers. So rather than looking for mentorship from just one person, focus your efforts on building a strong network of relationships, and not all of them should be with people who appear to be higher than you on the success totem pole. Here's what I mean. Number three, do not always look up, look to the side. So some of my most trusted advisors are people I consider peers. I'm not a person who puts a lot of emphasis on social hierarchy as it is, but when you're looking for people to connect with and learn from, do not underestimate the power of looking to your colleagues too. They might actually be behind you or maybe just a little bit ahead, so to speak, but here's why they are super valuable. Because oftentimes, they're closer to resolving the kinds of challenges and issues that you're struggling with right now. And when you talk with people who are so far beyond where you're currently at in your journey, they often don't even deal with the kind of problems that you're dealing with anymore. So their advice may not be as relevant or tactical. Also, they might be good at things that you're not, your colleagues. And so you guys can help each other, which means everybody wins. Number four, be specific, not vague. So one of the main reasons that people want to have a mentor in the first place is so they can shorten their learning curve and avoid making common mistakes. Well, here's one super common mistake that you can avoid whether you have an official mentor or not. When you ask questions, be specific, not vague. So for example, in your experience, what's the best membership site plugin out there if my budget is under $1,000 per year? Now, that is a way better question than, hey, will you mentor me in my online business? Bottom line, you are much more likely to get help if you ask for advice on how to solve a specific problem versus wanting someone to direct your entire project or your career. Number five is earn respect and trust through action. So this one is so huge. If there's someone out there that you really want to learn from, you got to be a true and devoted fan. So 
buy their books and leave reviews. Be a customer of their business if that makes sense. If someone teaches, go take their courses or their workshops and be a stellar standout student. If they speak, go buy a ticket, show up. And if you can, introduce yourself. And if they have an online presence, be a consistent, thoughtful, and engaged supporter. You want to let them know that their work affected you in some way. Like, tell them, how did it improve your life or how did it help you get results? Because people love hearing that they've had an impact. And look, as you've shared, people that are creating really cool things in this world are busy. Like, insanely busy. And it's not that they're ungenerous or they're narcissistic or they're stingy. They're usually just incredibly creative people who are stretched to the max to deliver on their mission. So the way that you earn trust and respect is by showing up in their world with a genuine, generous, and non-agenda-filled heart. You cannot be needy. You cannot be attached to an outcome. And of course, you cannot force someone to notice you. But I guarantee, if you're a consistent true fan, you're going to learn so much about how they operate simply by observing them and engaging with what they do. And that will teach you a ton in and of itself. Number six, do great work in the world. So this one is the most important step if you want to develop real relationships with people you admire. So start building up your body of work. Be consistent. Hustle your buns off. Nobody wants to start a business relationship with someone who isn't out there busting their hump and actually doing the work. So realize that if you stay focused on the quality of your work and you truly care for your people, so your customers, your clients, your fans, your colleagues, your bosses, whichever term fits for you, you will get noticed guaranteed. Rule number six is have patience. What does it take to build like a, a just such a large personal brand and impact so many people? Well, I think tremendous patience. Tremendous, tremendous patience. So sometimes people are like, Marie, what was like your breakthrough moment? Or what was the moment when everything changed? I was like, there wasn't one. I'm very much a worker bee. I'm very much the person who keeps my head down and just focuses on the work itself, the quality of the work. And uh, virtually every opportunity, and this probably goes against what a lot of other folks would tell you or maybe their experience. So I'm just going to speak truth into what has been mine. Yeah, where I have always just kept my attention on how can I make the highest quality work? And when I say that, it's not about it like looking perfect, although I, we do have aesthetic standards and I like things to feel a particular way because I think it speaks to emotion and heart and that's important to me. But more importantly, it's about helping people create results with the content and creating structures and making sure that things are actionable and that they're clear and that if someone actually took on our advice or used one of our products or our programs and they did it with good faith, that their results would just be so off the charts, their life would greatly transform. So I've never had a PR person. I still don't. Um, we've never done any type of uh, campaign to like get me on Oprah or anything like that. It has all been a result in my own belief system of that folks have noticed the quality of it. Rule number seven is ask powerful questions. Where you are in your life, it's all about being creative and exploring and learning exactly what you're doing. And here's the thing, you're probably going to change what you want to do for a career many times between now and when you finish your formal education and even as an adult too. Now for everybody else, especially if you're an adult and you're still asking yourself, what should I be when I grow up? Hopefully this will help you too. Instead of asking, what should I do? A way more powerful and useful question to ask yourself is who do I want to be? Meaning, what kind of person do you want to be in this world? What's the energy that you want to bring to anything that you actually do? So here's the thing. This is a very different question to ask yourself and it'll get you completely different results. After all, you are a human being, not a human doing, and who you are shows up in everything that you do. So Kristen, I want you to sit down and really ask yourself, who do I want to be in this world? Do I want to be loving, kind, inclusive? Do I want to be playful, engaged, compassionate? Really think through what being qualities are most important to you. Maybe it'll be 
being artistic and sharing your art with the world. Maybe it'll be being helpful and being a leader. Then just ask yourself, how can I take what's already in my heart and express this into the world? What can I do right now to express exactly who I am and who I wanna be? When I'm feeling lost, that's what I do. I ask myself, well, who do I wanna be right now? And the answer that most often pops up is loving and helpful. So then I say, okay, well, how can I spread some love right now? How can I be helpful and give to somebody else? And when I ask myself those questions, I often get intuitive flashes about things like projects I need to take on or things I need to go do, or sometimes it's as simple as picking up the phone and reaching out to someone and giving them some love. Rule number eight is take focused action. Most people try and figure out major life decisions in their heads and you just can't do that. It never works. You have to actually take action in one direction or another and start to feel your way. So when you go balls to the wall doing something, you actually feel the feedback and you're going to know whether or not it's the right direction for you. So here's another strategy that you can use. And it's a question that you can ask yourself when anything is major in your life, you need to know whether to move ahead or whether just to let it go. This is the question that I ask asked when I was considering whether or not I should move ahead professionally and go for being a professional dancer. Now you have to know this. When I was making this decision, it was when I was, I think around 24, 25, which in the dance world, that means I was older than dirt. Like people are retiring from their dance career at that age and I just wanted to start mine. So here's the question. In 10 years, will I regret not having done this? If you're honest with yourself, you're gonna get an immediate answer to that question. So for me, when I asked about professionally dancing, I knew that if I didn't go for it right then and there, that I was gonna regret it in 10 years. So I just got my ass to work <laughs> and started dancing. Finally, let's tackle the online branding part of your question. So you asked, when it comes to decide or figure out if I should combine all my passions, music, online business, yada, 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 in one brand or more, um, excuse me, in one brand or should I just focus on one niche, any tips? Yes. You have got to focus down first. You really need to get specific and choose just one thing to be an expert in, just one thing to focus on so you can kill it. That's really the secret to dominate, especially when you're starting an online business. Now here's the thing I want you to know. Just because you're focusing on one thing doesn't mean you're ignoring your other passion. So let's say you chose to focus on social media marketing. It's not like you can't talk about your love of music or your love of fitness and your about page. You're just not gonna try and do all of those things at once in an online business. Once you kill it with one specific niche in an online business, it's very easy then to broaden out and start to include more things, but you're gonna get yourself into trouble if you try and do too many things at once. When it comes to online business, our man Confucius has it dialed in. He says, he who chases two rabbits catches none. Rule number nine is keep dreaming. Today's question, it comes from Julia and she writes, hi Marie, I don't dream really big about my company development. I don't want a Porsche or to hire people or to be the chief general manager person. I'm interested in a life with a really good steady income, bit of a paradox when having a company, and doing what I like to do on my own while still having enough time for people I care about. So in general, is not having a plan for a big business with 20 plus workers a really bad thing? Regards from Poland, smiley face, Julia. Julia, I absolutely love this question because it gives me a chance to talk about something I don't get a chance to talk about nearly enough. Not giving a flying fudge about what other people think about how you should live your life or build your business, nor should you be spending any of your precious life energy trying to conform to some made up standard about how big you should dream. Now, back in the day, we were all taught that we should get a good job, we should get a family, a house, you know, have some security and play it safe. That was the old American dream, really the old should. But these days it's really starting to feel like dreaming big is the new should. That somehow if you're not dreaming big, you probably have small dream shame. That if you don't dream really, really huge, somehow you're not ambitious enough, you're not smart enough, and you're not valuable enough in this world. This idea is totally and absolutely not true. Small dream shame is total BS. And for so many people, dreaming big is actually crushing their soul. You want to know who's not a victim of small dream shame? My parents. 
My parents moved out to Vegas from New Jersey, and I recently went out there for a weekend visit. Now, their Vegas is not the Vegas that most people think of. So they're not living in some penthouse in the Mandalay Bay. They would never, ever want that. They live in a quiet little residential neighborhood. Their house is so simple. Their life is so simple, and they absolutely love it that way. They have no desire to eat at fancy places like Nobu. You want to know their favorite place in Vegas? It's a tiny little casino that has an amazing buffet and three people can eat for 20 bucks. Yes, 20 bucks. And they told me this probably about six times. It got them so excited and it got me excited for them. Now, world travel, traveling around the world, no interest at all. They do not want to be high rollers. They don't even gamble. You want to hear this one? They got themselves their own slot machine <laughs> and they filled it up with their own change so they can win what they already have. Now, some people may say, oh, that sounds crazy. I think it sounds amazing. They are so happy. They're not living small, they're living large and it's so inspiring to me. I'm also inspired by this, even if it sounds a little morbid. In the top five regrets of the dying, author Bronnie Ware discovered this. The number one regret of the dying is wishing they had the courage to live the life they wanted to live, not the one others had expected of them. The bottom line is that we have to think and dream independently. Each of us comes to earth with our own unique assignment and each of our dreams, no matter the size or scope, is valuable and perfect exactly as is. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is be a good leader. We kind of have some criteria internally whenever we're looking at a new opportunity. One of the things which, uh, and this is not, this might sound woo-woo, but it's really not. We always check in, how does this feel? So we'll talk about some of the concrete bits in terms of having resourcing, staff, people to handle things, but how does this feel to us? What's the why that we're doing this? So for example, the fact that we have a podcast now, one of the major reasons that we do is because we, first of all, we're constantly talking with our audience. We're constantly listening. Um, our biggest department in the company is customer happiness because we respond to every single email that comes in and we have conversations with folks. And what we heard consistently was that people were taking their phone, watching Marie TV, putting it on their passenger car seat so that they could listen while they were driving. And we were eating up all of their bandwidth, do you know what I mean, on their yeah. data plans. And they're like, can you please, I would just love to listen to it. We're like, yes! So we started creating the, the version as a podcast. So while we sometimes do audio only podcasts, yeah. a lot of times it's the same exact content that, we, absolutely. And people so appreciate it because they get it, but they don't have to eat up their data. So that was one of the criteria is like, oh, people really want this, what's the why? It's gonna help serve them in a really big level. And then when we checked in bandwidth wise with the company, someone on our team was like, I will own this. I love this. I know exactly how I can do it. It's not going to take me off track. So then we did it. Um, there's other times where an opportunity comes up and it's like, yeah, we could do that, but is it going to take us off track from these other things that we really enjoy, even if we can make more money? I get so many folks not as much anymore, but I would say maybe like five or six years ago, do you know how much money you're leaving on the table? I'm like, I don't care. Because having a really successful, thriving business is not just about the money. It's about how does your team operate? How do they feel showing up to work every day? How do you as the founder feel? Are you so stressed out that you wanna run away and hate that you even started this thing? Like, have you created a monster that you can't keep up with? If the answer is yes, you know, but again, I'm all about teaching people how to create a business and life they love, and that is not the way to do it. According to Frankel, he believed that one component of well-being is based on a certain degree of tension between what one has already accomplished and what one has yet to achieve. So in other words, who you are today and who you hope to become tomorrow. So if you're worried or ever have those thoughts that somehow you're a failure because you haven't achieved all of your dreams quite yet, listen to me when I say this, you are not a failure. That tension is a really good thing. Thing. So embrace that drive that you have. Embrace your ambition and the gap between where you are and who you are today and where you want to go and who you want to become over the next year and 10 years and so on. So when it comes to making meaning in our lives, Frankel shares three simple avenues. 
The first avenue is creating work or doing a deed. In other words, having a project that you're working on that requires your skills and abilities. You know, one of the most powerful stories in the book for me was when Frankel arrived at Auschwitz and he had the manuscript for a book that he was working on and he had it in his coat pocket. And when he arrived, they confiscated it from him, just like everything else. And he was heartbroken. But what he did throughout his time there is he started looking for these little scraps of paper and he was collecting them so he could start recreating his manuscript. And that really helped keep him focused. And there was this other thing that he shared that I really related to. You know, um, while I have a stepson and I have a fur baby, I don't have any biological children. And he was talking about this book being his mental child. And having the ability to focus on that mental child and how important it was for him to nurture it and bring it to life and put that manuscript back together was really a key in helping him survive that experience. The second avenue, by experiencing something or someone. So in other words, experiencing beauty or truth or goodness or love, whether that's through nature or by loving someone else. You know, Frankel shares these moments throughout the book. For example, when he was being transferred from Auschwitz to a Bavarian camp by train, how he and everyone was in this crowded train and they were crowding around this tiny barred window just to catch a glimpse of the mountainside and the beautiful sunset. And in Frankel's own words, he said, we were carried away by nature's beauty, which we had missed for so long. Or the other thing that really stood out to me in the book was how much Victor connected with his wife through his thoughts and his imagination and how much his love for her kept him fueled and really kept him going. And there was one passage that I want to read, which sums it up. He wrote, Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a brief moment in the contemplation of his beloved. The third and final avenue is the attitude that we take towards unavoidable suffering. In other words, our human capacity to transform personal tragedy into triumph. And this is probably the biggest message that I took away from the book. You know, Victor discovered through surviving what is arguably one of the most horrific experiences you could ever imagine that he was able to find meaning and growth and a deeper sense of who he was as a human being as a result. And there was one really incredible insight that he shared, which was this. In some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. We hear stories about this every day, right? I mean, where people face unimaginable challenges that could break them, but somehow they wind up growing stronger and more resilient and even more fulfilled as a result. So while there are many different schools of thought around meaning and fulfillment, I found Viktor Frankl's three-part framework really speaks to my heart. One of the reasons that I love it so much is because I think many of us can get lost looking outside of ourselves for how to create a meaningful life. And what Viktor Frankl so beautifully teaches us is that each of those three avenues is completely within our control. So whether you're watching this over the holidays or any time of year and you're feeling a little down or you're feeling a little empty, I want you to remember this. Rather than searching for life's meaning, remember that you always have the power to create it. You've got to take responsibility for the energy that you allow in your life. I want you to fend off negativity as much as humanly possible. You know, we know so much more about the brain than we did just 20 years ago. Neuroscience has taught us incredible things, like that our brains are continuously shaped by our thoughts and our experiences. And you know this to be true. Negativity is one of the most toxic forces on the planet. It's toxic for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your ability to stay motivated. Do me this favor. Do not solicit or listen to the opinions of people who are notorious for just being Debbie Downers. The one mistake that I've seen people make consistently is they almost habitually talk to the exact person who is the most likely to shoot them down and make them feel like crap. So don't do that. And here's another key. I want you to always consider the source. Meaning, don't put a lot of stock into other people's opinions unless they're actually out there consistently taking risks and being brave and actually making things happen. I mean, if you 
think about it. Let's say you wanted to climb Mount Everest. Would you ever take advice from someone who's never even attempted the summit? No, of course not. That would be crazy. So don't take advice from anyone unless you really think it through. There's a prompt in here that I have used so many times in my life and so many times in my business that has transformed everything. In a business context, it's led to like multi-million ideas. And in a life context, oh my goodness, I can't even tell you how many things it's helped me shift. And it all comes back to tapping into that wisdom that I already have in my heart that I wasn't really aware of. So what you're going to need is a journal or just a notebook or a piece of paper. And I want you to give yourself at least 50 15 to 20 minutes of uninterrupted time with no cell phones around, no things ringing or dinging, no televisions, no nothing. I just need you to put yourself in a place where it can be kind of quiet, where you're really comfortable. Maybe you have a little cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something stronger if that's what you're into, whatever floats your boat. And you're going to use this sentence stem to start to unearth what Ellen might really want to focus on in this next chapter of her life. So the sentence stem goes like this. Wouldn't it be cool if dot, dot, dot. So I want you to write down on the paper, wouldn't it be cool if, and then whatever springs up in your mind and your heart, I just want you to write it down. So wouldn't it be cool if I lived in Hawaii? Wouldn't it be cool if I could solve world hunger? Wouldn't it be cool if I had platinum blonde hair? I don't know. I'm just making stuff up off the top of my head. But what this exercise does is it starts activating your imagination. It starts dusting off that ability you have to dream that I suspect may have been put on the back burner for so many years because you've been focused on so many other people because you're so responsible and you're so loving and you're such a good person. But now, my friend Ellen, now is the time for you to rediscover what's in your heart and what would really be cool for you to focus on in this next chapter. And I promise you, If you play with this prompt, wouldn't it be cool if, and you let yourself dream without editing, without squashing something down because you feel like, oh, that's impossible. That can never happen. No, we don't do that in brainstorming. We let everything down on the page. I promise you, you will start to unearth something that's going to make you go, oh, that feels amazing. Could I really do that? Could I really be that? Could I really pursue that? And you're going to get like little tinglys. Arms will stand, the arm hair will stand up, all that kind of good stuff. But it will only happen if you give yourself this ability to play with this prompt and do it until you can't write anymore. Frame your dream. And here's what this means. We can't become what we can't envision. So when I say frame your dream, what I mean is I want you to take a picture of it in your mind's eye in vivid, specific detail. And then what I want you to do is translate that picture into words, meaning write down that big, unrealistic dream. And I know that you may have heard about the power of writing things down before, but the truth is most people just don't do it, which is so crazy because the research is conclusive on this. There was a study done by Dr. Gail Matthews that shows that you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. So what I want you to do is whip out your journal or hop on that keyboard and get writing. Last year, I had a life-changing carb craving. Specifically, I wanted a croissant. And my first thought I should walk around the corner to that cute little French bakery that I've been always meaning to try. It's one of those places that you probably have in your neighborhood where you walk by a million times, but for whatever reason, you never go in. So I walk over, and as I'm getting up to the door, I notice this little white piece of paper on the glass door, and it says this, closed due to vacation. Now, typically when I go to a store and it's closed, I'm usually like, wah, wah. But this time, I was actually like, OMG, closed due to vacation? It's a revelation. This is a party. (laughs) There was no disappointment. In fact, it was super inspiring to me that someone could close down their entire business for an extended period of time just for vacation. So nobody died. They weren't going out of business. It wasn't renovation. Nope. 
They just wanted to take time off. So I got so excited by this idea that I forgot I even wanted a croissant. I ran home, called up my team, and I told them, we are closing down at the end of the year for two whole weeks. And we did it then, and guess what? We're doing again right now. We're closing down for the next two weeks. Now you gotta get, this was a pretty big move for me. Doing stuff nonstop is pretty much in my DNA. I mean, I've been working consistently since I was 10 years old. Yes, I've taken vacations, but this idea of completely closing down your entire company for an extended period of time, that's pretty radical, at least for me. I mean, I know they do that kind of stuff in Europe, but I've never really seen it done here. And in this digital age, and since I run a digital company, I feel like there's this ever-growing pressure to always be on and always be responding and always be engaging and always be creating something new. But the truth is, from my point of view, this always on, always pushing, always going, it's really a sickness. And over time, it can destroy you. It can destroy your health and your creativity and your relationships and everything. And I mean, when it comes to your team, it can burn them out and take them completely out. And the more experience I have in this world, the more I see that personally, my soul craves downtime. It craves playtime. It craves time completely just off the grid. Now, if you're anything like me and you're super passionate about what you do, even just the thought of taking significant time off can feel scary. I mean, after all, let's say you take yourself off the grid and all of a sudden everybody forgets about you or you miss out on some huge opportunity or, goodness gracious, your competitors get ahead. (gasps) No! But here's what I learned when we shut our whole company down for two weeks last year. It was the best thing we've ever done. Everybody, including myself, came back so refreshed and rejuvenated. And the entire team came back with new ideas to take the company to the next level. And I came back with a pinata and this really handsome sombrero. Which we are totally making a product around. I mean, you know, create a sombrero and a pinata you love. I'm telling you all of this because I want you to remember two important things. First up, great things happen when you unplug from technology and you plug into your real life. Now, as much as I love technology and I really do love it, I have learned it is vital to take time to just let yourself be. Because if you're constantly listening to the noise of the world, it's impossible to hear the whispers of your soul. What's that? My soul just told me that's a tweetable. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, this sounds great, Marie, but I can't take two weeks off right now, or I can't take a whole week off, that's completely fine. But ask yourself, can you take 48 hours off, or maybe just one day? And number two, the whole point of this episode is this. You get to write the rules in your business and your life. Question everything that you think you have to do. Really challenge those assumptions. Do you have to be on Twitter? especially if you don't like it? Do you have to work on Mondays? Do you even have to wear underwear? Do you have to wear pants? That's it, jams. Ole. But seriously, do not undercut your ability to craft a business and a life that you truly love. My question, how can I go about projecting myself as a writer first and a teacher second? What business steps can I take to make this transformation? Thank you for all you do, Christina. All right, so Christina, we got some good answers for you today. There's actually three very simple, very effective things that you can do right now to make that transformation and make it happen fast. The first one is speak it. So words have tremendous power. All you gotta do next time you find yourself at a cocktail party, just say you're a writer first. Um, So anytime you introduce yourself, talk about writing, talk about your books, talk about everything else before you start saying you're a teacher and that's gonna make a huge difference. So um, what we like to say is just do it. Just do it. Just do it, Christina. Number two, number two, you want to write it. So all language that goes out into the world, think about this. What does your email signature say? What does your business card say? What about any social media profiles? The very first thing that you should have is ding, 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 writer. So if you don't have writer as the first thing listed on all of your written paraphernalia, go and make that change right now. I'll wait. Do it? Did you just do it? Okay, good. Um, Number three, and this is the most important one of all, is be it. 
you have to write as much as you can. So if you don't have a blog, I would highly suggest you start blogging. Perhaps journaling will be more your thing, but just really be the writer that you actually are. And it becomes pretty simple if you're doing something habitually, you're writing every day, you're putting out blog posts, you're publishing more books. Naturally, it's gonna be the first thing that pops out of your mouth. The courage came from pain. And here's what I mean by that. When I first started out, I was trying so hard to be someone else because I had this idea in my mind that I probably formed when I was a little girl about what a successful businesswoman looked like, how she should act. And it was involved with this. Again, this is like taking it back. I grew up in the 80s, right? So I imagined a successful businesswoman would probably like have some corner office in a high rise building in New York City and have like a suit with shoulder pads and like wear high heels and pantyhose and walk around in a very authoritative like an, an authoritative, excuse me, authority voice, you know, like just like strong and talking and blah, 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 blah. And also there was a big thing for me about like intelligence and high levels of education. I don't really, I'm the first in my family to go to college and uh, I'm from Jersey and I don't always use proper language. I fumble over my words just like I just did. And when I tried to create content, when I first started off, it was so stilted. It was so stiff. It had no personality. And guess what? It had no results. It was terrible. And so the pain of like working so hard and not having anything work and feeling like I was banging my head against the wall. And I was like, I can't do this. I can't be this professional business person. And the other thing was this, I was so young when I started coaching. So I was 23 years old and I was completely aware of how ridiculous this was. Who the hell is going to hire a 23 year old life coach? Like I hadn't even lived life yet. I had piles of debt. I had failed in all these different careers, like nothing made sense, but I had the heart. And so the big shift came when I had banged my head against the wall so many times trying to be like different than who I was to get people to like me. And I was like, this is bullshit. I can't do this. I'm not built this way. I have no filter. If I really, if people are going to like actually want to hire the real me, they need to see the real me. And that was the shift. I really had no other choice because it felt like I was dying a slow death to try and pretend to be someone else who I really wasn't. Sometimes the only way to create what you really want means walking away from the sure thing you already have. Now, before we dive into this, I want to share a little line from Jim Collins, the author of the classic book, Good to Great. Jim says, Good is the enemy of great and is why so many things don't become great. We don't have really great schools because we have good schools. We don't have great companies because we have so many good ones. And when we look back over a life and see if it's a great one, we don't see many because it's just so easy to settle for a good one. Now, if we unpack this a bit, we'll see that there's two main factors that keep us trapped in good land. Number one is comfort. Whether it's a certain amount of money that you're used to making or a warm body next to you when you're watching Game of Thrones, sometimes it's hard to walk away from the sure thing you already have because you're not sure if you're gonna find something out there that's better to fill the void. Marie, don't leave Goodland. It's good enough here. Number two is what I call OPE, other people's expectations. Tough to ignore, but fun to dance to. You down with OPE? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPE? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPE? Yeah, you know me. Who's down with OPE? Not this whole me. The reason OPE is so hard to break free from is because we don't want to disappoint people, we don't want to let them down, and of course we don't want to rock the boat. But if you want to shift anything from good to great, you got to be willing to shake some shiz up. Which is exactly what I had to do when I walked away from over a million dollars in revenue. Yes, people were disappointed, and yes, people thought I was crazy pants. Little side note, if people think you're crazy pants, you are probably wearing the right pants. That's deep. So here's the story. Back in the day, I had two awesome programs. One was an annual conference that we held at Donna Karen's Urban Zen Center, and the other was a year-long mentorship and travel program called Adventure Mastermind. 
Both of these programs sold out each year with a waiting list. They were fun, they were life-changing, and they were like nothing else on the market. And they were both really profitable. However, I was having this inner tug inside that it was time for me to clear the decks and work on new projects that would allow me to change as many lives as possible. Now, I'm not gonna front, this was not easy to do. A, a million dollars is a lot of freaking money, and B, I love what I do, and it was hard for me to disappoint so many people who wanted to take those programs but then wouldn't have a chance to. So I couldn't deny what I knew to be true, which was that it was time for me to walk away. And that's what I did. Now check this out. About a week or so after I decided to take those programs off the market, I got a call from Oprah's folks to be on Super Soul Sunday. Coincidence? Maybe, or maybe it was meant to be. Because you can't have really amazing stuff show up in your life if you don't have room for it. So let's wrap this up with a few things to keep in mind. First of all, we always say that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it ain't broke, it doesn't mean that you should keep it. Furthermore, things don't have to be crashing and burning around you in order for you to walk away. You can leave on a high note, things don't have to get dramatic and they don't have to get crazy. Second, as Jim Collins said, good is the enemy of great. Complacency can be a curse, so watch out for it. Many of the times what stops us all from figuring something out is we're afraid, right? We're afraid maybe we won't be able to do it or we're just afraid of the area that we need to walk into in order to figure it out. And then people often have asked me, you know, well, how do I know the difference between healthy fear that would be very good for me to move through versus my intuition or a gut instinct or a hunch going, no, 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 <laughs> that's actually going to be a shit show, right? Like, yeah. or that's just going to be, it's, it's something you should not do. And that's a really important question. Here's what's awesome. You don't need to go asking other people for the answer. You have all of the wisdom you need inside of you. Here's the reality check that hit me like a ton of bricks. All of the joy and excitement and fun that we want in life never comes from external circumstances. It always comes from the energy and the attention and the consciousness that we bring into each and every moment. So Lori, I talked about this a lot. And if you really want to solve this problem, I need you to go read page 10 in my book, Make Every Man Want You. It's all about making isness your business. So what does that mean? Making isness your business means that you show up in each moment and you do this moment like you friggin' mean it. That means you bring your A game. That means you bring your full enthusiasm, your attention, your love to whatever you're doing, wherever you are, and whoever you're with. Why? Because all pain and frustration and annoyance in our life comes from resisting the moment. It comes from saying, this moment isn't how it should be. But guess what? The moment already is. So you only have two choices in life. You can either resist it and be freaking miserable, or you can engage with the moment and have a damn good time. In fact, make it an engagement party. You guys... I'm engaged with the moment. Oh, uh, that's what? No. Okay. That's right. You got to love the moment and put a ring on it. Because the truth is, you can feel fully alive in any situation or you can feel like total crap in any situation. It's not the circumstances, it's actually what you bring to them. Once I really got this, I was so much happier. I was performing in my jobs better and ironically, everything that I wanted to create in my future started happening a lot faster. Should I get a degree with a secure job at the end of it? So little reality check for you, my love, those days are over. <laughs> There's really no such thing as a secure job anymore. Um, I think if you take a look around at what's happening in the world, you go into any Starbucks and you'll see some uh, lawyers and some stockbrokers networking out of there who would totally back me up on this. Paige, I know you said you want to start your own business, and that's awesome. But for everyone else, even if you don't want to start your own business, hear me on this. Entrepreneurship is a mindset that everyone on the planet needs. If you want to thrive now and in the future, the only people that are going to really make it in this world are people that'll take initiative, that'll take action, and that think and behave like entrepreneurs. And one of the first and most important things about that is getting real comfortable with not giving a flying fudge what other people think about you. 
Let me take you back in my own life. I was only a few years older than you when I decided that I wanted to be a life coach. Now, you got to get this. This was back when no one even heard of a life coach. Those words life coach made as much sense to people as dream farmer or potato doctor. And exhale. You still getting baked? Just turn your head and cough for me. Plus, I was 23 years old. I mean, who in their right mind would hire a 23-year-old life coach? Even I was rolling my eyes at myself. The point is, don't let anyone's bullshit opinions or judgments about what you can't do, especially your own, stop you from following your dreams. You will never do anything great in your life if you've got this song stuck in your head. Judging us is judging you. They judge your every move. And judging us is judging you. Judging us. They're judging you, judging you, judging you, judging you. Paige, you say you want to plan parties and events, so get to it, woman. Don't wait for people to give you permission or until you have some degree. Just find somebody who needs a party plan and plan the confetti out of it. And then you do another, and then another, and then another, and then all of a sudden... Mazel tov! You are a party planner. Now, in terms of education, I am 100% for education. In fact, I always advocate for people to be lifelong learners. But don't limit your education to only what you can learn in the classroom. You should consider getting a job or two with more established event planners so you can really learn about the industry from the inside out. And then there's one more thing, and this is my final and perhaps more important piece of advice. You've got to be really conscious of who you surround yourself with. You've got to get rid of everybody who's negative and all the naysayers. So if that means getting some new friends, definitely do it. And you also want to feed yourself some really positive things to your mind and your body and your soul day after day. When I was first training in terms of wanting to be a coach and becoming a coach, um, it was so much in terms of personal development work and it was awesome. I loved working with clients. I was like 23, 24 years old. And not only was I helping folks try and get results in their own life, I was also doing this work on myself. And one of the things I realized was that defining myself as a coach, first of all, that never really quite felt right to me. It felt very limiting and narrow and not quite on. But I admitted that I had this dream to dance. Now, let's set some background. No dance training whatsoever. Never taken a formal dance class in my life. <laughs> and it was like I was around 24, 25, which sadly in the professional dance world, it's a little over the hill to start, right? right. That's a very, very late start. And anyway, I finally got real with myself that I wanted to do this. And so I started taking professional dance classes in New York City. And it was amazing. I found myself coming alive and coming alive. And this was great. And so I, I um, was taking class at Crunch Fitness. And my teachers were like, you're actually really good. And I remember, Jay, I was literally like, are you talking about me? I was like, wait, wait, th like, I don't have any technique. They're like, no, 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 you should really consider start teaching. And I was no like, way. yeah, wow. which given the fact that previous to that, I had, you know, failed on Wall Street, I had failed in the magazine industry, I had, had all these failures. And I was keeping myself alive, quite frankly, because I wasn't earning a lot of money as a coach by bartending and waiting tables. So the fact that someone thought I was good at something was that just little grain of like, oh, you are kind of good at something. It was great. Cut to. I said, all right, I'm going to try out and become um, a substitute teacher at Crunch. I'm going to teach these hip hop classes. I had no idea what the hell so I was cool. doing. You're so cool. <laughs> so Love that. Uh, it was just sheer passion, right? And I was just doing everything I could, just trying to make it through. One of my first classes ever that I taught on my own Someone came up to me after class and she said, you're really good. And I was like, thank you. That means the world to me. She's like, you know, I work for MTV and we're working on a new show and we are looking for a choreographer slash producer. You should come in. And Jay, it was a moment like this was my first real class ever. Again, so like nervous and awkward and unsure of myself. So what came through my head? You're not ready yet. Mm. That it was like, 
I was even praying. I was like, universe, why did this have to happen? I am certainly not ready. I'm not good. I don't know what the hell is going on, but this is an amazing opportunity because I grew up on MTV. Yeah, so I couldn't say no, right? Because again, I could hear my inner clock going like, girl, you're not getting any younger, so you might as well say yes. So I said yes to this opportunity. And I remember standing outside of the Viacom building in New York City the day before I was like, when I was about to go up for this interview that afternoon. And Jay, I wanted to throw up Like I was so nauseous. I was so not ready. Like I was actually thinking, should I throw up in this like metal trash can or should I like go inside and go to the bathroom so that I can clean myself up before I actually went to the interview? So I went into the building and um, I stood in front of the boss's door, the, the, the person who I was going to interview with. And I like shook myself out and I just said, you are not ready, but you're going to start before you're ready because it's an incredible opportunity. And no matter what happens, you're going to feel good about yourself that you just went for it. And I went in for that interview and I booked the job. Wow. And so it was this experience of me putting myself into kind of this whole world that I was in over my head. So let's be clear. I was working with dancers that had decades more experience than I did. They were talking about dance terms that not only could I not perform, I didn't even know what the hell they were, but I made my way through by showing up as professionally as I could, by being honest about my inexperience, but also by bringing my gifts that I did have to the table. And that one opportunity dancing and choreographing and producing for MTV, that led to fitness videos. That led to this increased learning curve where I got to learn basically three to four years worth of experience in like three months, which eventually led to me choreographing commercials for Reebok and then eventually becoming um, one of the world's first Nike elite dance athletes, all because I was willing to start before I was ready. And every single area of my life, I still do it in business to this day. There's so many things I say yes to that I'm like, somewhere in the back of my mind is like, you're not ready yet. And I'm like, that means I got to go. <laughs> that means I got to strap myself in and go like, we're doing this. I will learn as I go. Yeah. So this idea of starting before we're ready, it doesn't mean that we're irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that we don't do our research. And it doesn't mean that we override our intuition that if perhaps, you know, there was years ago, and I'll say this, that people approached me to write a book yes. and I legitimately wasn't ready yet, but it was because my focus was in other areas. Mm-hmm. Oh, I had other priorities. I knew from a deeper level, it wasn't about the fear. It was about trusting my own timing. Yes. But when you know you want to do something and you're clear that this is your path, Using the mantra, start before you're ready, is an amazing way to beat procrastination, to leapfrog over your fear, and to get going. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Jenna Kutcher, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Everything started as a side hustle. I had to build up the confidence in myself to go all in on every single thing. I feel like there are two camps of people. The people who are like, jump and the net will appear. And the people who are like, let me weave my net.